Hey Northeast, I hope as those scriptures from Psalm 51 and 119 were going on the screen, you were able to just catch your breath and breathe and be renewed by God's word. In this unique season that we're in, one thing that I've realized is that the rush into worship and all of the distractions are still very present. They're just really different. So for those of us that are parents, instead of wrangling our kids in a car and rushing into church, we're now gathering our families into watch parties in our living rooms and we find ourselves fighting against the distractions of just being home. For the kids and the students, I'm sure you miss seeing your leaders worshiping alongside your friends and maybe just grabbing a latte and hanging out in the cafe. And now this just seems really different and kind of weird. But the question still remains, how are we preparing our hearts for this time with him? The place of our worship has changed, but the object, Jesus God, is still the same. So after the rush into service and however things have looked for you today, let's just take a pause together to clear our minds and to allow the real reason of our worship to come front and center. After that, we'll lift up our voices in adoration and thanksgiving for what God has done for us. But right now, let's just take a moment to pause to reflect.
welcome everyone. Thank you for worshiping with us today. My name's Matt. I have the privilege of being on staff at Northeast. Want to extend a special welcome to you. We know it's it's been a long season of watching online, but this is a unique way that we get to we get to worship the Lord together and turn our houses into sanctuaries of praise. What a testimony uh, and witness to our neighbors, even to our own family. So I'm glad that you are doing this and I hope you are singing loud uh, today. I have a couple of announcements for you. The first is that we look forward to a moment where we will be gathering together very soon. Actually, this week on the 22nd at 6 p.m., it's gonna be worship night on the lawn. We have guidelines in place. Hopefully you've received those already via email. So make sure you read those and, and that you're prepared. Okay, it's really important, critically important uh, for us to care for and safeguard our community. All right, and that's why these, these guidelines are in place from social distancing to masks, it helps us stay safe. So make sure that you uh, read those, you are ready and prepared. We have those posted on our Facebook page. We have those posted on our website, northeastcc.com. Go to upcoming events and, and also via email. So if you haven't received that email, you can sign up for it on our website as well. All right, our next announcement is about groups. This season has been tough. Uh, it's been isolating both physically and spiritually, and that isolation can take a toll on you. We, we've seen it in, in our own family, we've seen it in the Northeast family, and felt it, and we just don't want that for you. We want every person who calls Northeast home to know what it means to be loved, cared for, and to be growing spiritually, and that happens inside of a group. So make sure that you check out our groups page. We have uh, groups that are gathering uh, in person and virtually, and we have new groups starting all the time, existing groups. We want to see you get connected so that you can grow. All right, so visit our groups page, northeastcc.com slash groups, and check it out. And now we're going to move uh, into a time uh, of offering. And uh, growing up, I always wondered why uh, people you know, would say that offering was an act of worship, because it just didn't seem to me uh, as a kid to be worshipful in any way. Uh, but there's a particular reason why we do that. You know, 1 Chronicles 16, 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. So we're going to continue in that attitude of worship. And I pray that that's, that's how you bring your offering uh, th this morning. Whether you're doing it uh, online, northeastcc.com slash giving, whether you're dropping off something at the church just because you want to uh, park in the parking lot or maybe see somebody and wave uh, through a window, um, or you're mailing it in, however you're doing that. I pray that, that as you do it, you are ascribing to the Lord the glory do His name. And so we're going to continue in that attitude of worship as we sing together about what Christ has done for us. Let's do it. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
I often think that the work of preparing for communion is personal. You know, I need to prepare myself for communion. I need to work on my own heart before communion. But one of the things that Paul says to the church at Corinth is, you've kind of disqualified yourself from the communion table because there's disunity among you, right? There's the haves and the have-nots. You are segregated in the local church, and that does not please the Lord. And Paul is picking up what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5. Jesus says, if you're at the altar, right, if you're at the church service, and, and your brother has something against you, then leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother, and then offer your gift. I think that's why Jesus prays after the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in John 17, Father, make them one. Make them one. His desire for his people was unity. And I, I want you to prepare to take communion. And I know this looks different as we do it in our homes from the elements that we use to just the distractions that surround us. Maybe you have uh, uh, pets in the room that are barking or running around or, or you, somebody's knocking on your door or there's a package or something or the, the phone, your phone is ringing or text. I, I, I understand. Uh, but you know what Paul says to the church? Don't rush into this. Right, may, may uh, you examine yourself, right? May men and women examine themselves. Um, uh, don't just grab whatever you've prepared and, and make a quick meal of this. Examine yourself, confess your sins, knowing that he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so today I would, I would challenge those who are struggling with disunity. Maybe you're seeing the impact of disunity in your own family. Maybe you're seeing it, uh, that impact in the body of Christ or uh, in your friend group. All right? Maybe it has to do uh, with issues related to COVID or um, issues you know, politicized by the news and embraced and even you know, uh, riled up by our 24-hour news cycle. Or, or perhaps um, it's disunity over the issue of race. And I, I want to challenge you. If there's resentment, if there's bitterness, uh, if there's cynicism or even a sense of apathy, you know, that this doesn't even affect you or, or, or maybe you're more angry at the protests than what is causing the, the protests. There's disunity there and maybe right now, maybe right now where you're sitting, the Spirit of God might speak to you as you confess your sins before Him and receive His forgiveness. And we're just going to take a moment to do that. I'm going to pray. God, you are, you are one who does not hold grudges. You say that, that you will remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. What a good God you are. I see you huddled. Yeah, I picture that you, you huddled in, in that upper room as you were sharing the meal with your followers, with your disciples. And there on one side is Simon the Zealot who comes from a very particular point of view. And on the other side is Levi who comes from a very different point of view. And yet you called them to become one. You called them to uphold and value one another. And so God, as we press in, to uh, these elements, to the bread and the cup as we take them uh, in our homes right now at different times and, 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 and in different ways. And, uh, we know what those elements symbolize. Your, the bread, your body, which was broken for us, and the cup, your blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we do that, and I pray we would remember the sacrifice that you gave so that we might become one. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, take communion together.
morning, Northeast. My name is Mike Coupler, and today we are going to be continuing our study through the Gospel of Mark. And I want to remind you that as we go through this study, as we continue to read this Gospel, our goal is not to simply teach you what the Gospel of Mark says. Our hope in this series is that you would read along with us, that you would be um, learning directly from the source, directly from the Word and from God, what He has for you. So please join us this coming week in reading Mark chapter 10. Well, I want to open up with a word of prayer as we dive into God's Word. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity we have to open up your word together and to study what it has for us. God, I pray that you would speak through me, um, that it would not be my words, but that it would be your words for this congregation and that um, you would speak to the people watching, the people um, who have joined together um, to study your word, that you would be moving in our lives and moving in Northeast and in Rockford. We love you, Lord, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, today we are going to be reading Mark chapter 9, and specifically we're going to be focusing on a group of verses from 30 to 37. And we're focusing on this part because up to this passage um, in chapter 9, Jesus has spent a lot of time in crowds. Um, He's been interacting with large groups of people, and he has this, this moment, he has this episode where he is separated, where it's just him and his disciples, and he has a chance to very intentionally teach them. And so we're going to hone in on that passage um, as we study God's word today. So starting in verse 30, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching the disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. You see, this is... The second time that Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be killed, um, that he did not come to this earth to be a conqueror, but to die for us. And as he's teaching them, they were not getting the message. This was, like I said, the second time that he has told them this, um, and they still aren't hearing clearly what he's trying to teach them. And it says that even in this passage that they were afraid to ask any questions. And that stands out to me because their relationship is one where they should feel open to asking questions. That there shouldn't be any guilt, any shame, or any pause in reaching out to Jesus and saying, Hey, what do you mean by that? Are you saying that you're going to die? Can we clarify this question with you? But something is holding them back. Something is in their hearts that is preventing them from speaking up, from raising this concern or this question. And I think we get our answer to why they were afraid to ask in these next two verses. 33 and 34 say, They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. This passage kind of stuns me when I read it. We have a group of disciples who have been living, traveling, teaching with Jesus. And just a chapter ago, they had made this proclamation that he was the Christ. They had made this amazing declaration of faith and belief in him. And then just a chapter later, they are arguing about which of them is the greatest. They are standing in the midst of the person that they have called the Messiah, the Christ, God come down to earth, and they're arguing about which of the 12 of them is the greatest. Can you see the irony in that? Well, I think this is part of what held them back from speaking up because their association with Jesus, at least to a degree, was self-serving. They knew that by associating with the Messiah that it would raise their status. It would raise their place in society. And so if he were to die, that would not help their cause. That would not help their individual status. We don't know for sure, but I believe that this is part of why they were afraid to ask. Because they didn't want to know that Jesus was going to die. They wanted to believe that he was going to live a long life, that he was going to rule over the world and establish God's kingdom the way they saw it coming. They're walking in the presence of Jesus and they're questioning which of them is greater. 
going on into verse 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. You see, Jesus sitting down is, is not just him taking a load off or resting his feet after a long journey. A rabbi sitting down in the midst of his disciples was a way of saying, the next thing I'm about to say is really important, so listen up. I remember growing up, whenever my mom would sit on the fireplace in our living room and talk to us, it meant we were in trouble. Something, something big was going to happen. Something important was about to be said, so we need to listen up. And it was it was really defining moment. Whenever she would come into the living room, sit down in the fireplace, we knew, turn the TV off, sit up straight, and don't look away from mom. And it was just a learned behavior. And for the disciples, it's that same thing. It's that, as my parents called it, the come to Jesus meeting. And so he sits down and, and he has all attention on him. And he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He does two things with this phrase that are powerful for the disciples. The first one is that even though they were too embarrassed, too afraid, too shy to speak up and say what they were talking about on the road, Jesus cuts through and says, I already know what you were talking about. I, I know that you were arguing about which one of you is the greatest. Immediately there's this I don't know if it would have been relief for them that, that Jesus already knew that they didn't have to try and hide it or if it would be this shame that would come over them. But there was something released in that moment where Jesus says, I see what you guys were talking about. And clearly, I, I'm recognizing the pride in that statement. And then he goes on and, and in that phrase, he also calls out their pride and says, and flips it on its head. He says, if you want to be the greatest, that's what you guys really are striving for. That's really what's in your heart. Well, to be the greatest, you need to be the least. To be the, the top dog, you need to serve and be the bottom for a while. Jesus calls his disciples to move away from their pride into humility. He flips all of their uh, presuppositions on its head and tells them that they need to be a humble servant in order to be exalted. I want to spend some time today uh, defining humility, defining what that looks like for us. And, and I want to have a, a similar definition that we're working from. So this is the Mike Coupler definition of humility. True humility comes from elevating others before ourselves and lowering ourselves before God. True humility comes from elevating others before ourselves and lowering ourselves before God. I want to take some time to break down those two points because I think it's really crucial that we understand what each of those is saying. First, what does it mean to elevate others before ourselves? Jesus addresses this in verses 36 and 37. It says, he took a little child who he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now this comment was a big deal because in this society, there was a very defined hierarchy. Um, There's a very strong power structure and power dynamic built up. And the whole premise of the society was that you interacted with people who are going to elevate your status. You're going to interact with people who, who made you more powerful or made you more wealthy. There was no sense in interacting with people who would lower your status or lower your power because you were trying to just gain more. And so Jesus takes the bottom rung in their society. A child did not offer you any value, any power, any esteem in a society. They were seen as heirs. Eventually they would add, but where they were at didn't add any value to you. And so he takes the lowest person in this hierarchy, in this structure, and he says, treat them like you would treat me. He says, welcome them as if you were welcoming me. And this was a wild thing, but it was something that was evident throughout all of Jesus' teaching. In other passages, specifically Matthew 25, 
he refers to this same idea, the same teaching, but instead of talking about children specifically, he says the least of these. These are the people in our society who are overlooked. These are the people in society that aren't seen as, as, as valuable as others. They're forgotten, they're, they're mistreated, they're ignored. Who is that in, in your life? Who, who are the least of these that you interact with? I think it's pretty evident today that there are still these people groups. There, there are the refugees, there are the people of color, there are, in some circles, women, um, children. In our society, there are groups of people that are overlooked and unseen. Those are the people that we are called to serve here. Those are the people that we are called to be looking out for, to be welcoming as if we were welcoming Jesus himself. Jesus equates himself with the least of these. He says that when you welcome a child, you're welcoming me. When you welcome the least, you're welcoming the greatest. What Jesus does is he ascribes the value of his own life to the value of these other people. He says the the least of these in society have my value, have the greatest value. I want to pause here and give you an opportunity to reflect, to um, think over this question, because I don't want us to miss this idea. I think this is such a powerful moment in our society. This is a powerful time for us to consider how we can interact with the least of these. So I want you to pause and, and think about the least of these in your life. Who, who is that? Maybe you're thinking of a grouping of people or maybe a specific person. Um, you don't have to call that out, but after you've thought of who the least of these might be in your life, I want you to ask yourself this question. What could you do for the least of these to show them the value that Jesus has placed on them? Take a few minutes to talk that over. Well, thank you for taking that time for um, engaging in that. And I want to move on to the second part of our definition of humility. Just to remind you, true humility comes from elevating others before ourselves and lowering ourselves before God. So what does it mean to lower ourselves before God? I think this part of the definition is vital. It's essential for us, especially when we consider not only being humble, but countering pride in our lives. You see, the disciples in this passage were seeking their own power, their own gain. 
Um, it wasn't all they were seeking, and I don't mean to call them out or to make it seem like they were um, you know, abnormally bad. We all have this tendency in our lives. Um, we have a, an inherent desire to try and advance ourselves. Um, we want more money, more power, um, for good or for bad. We all have pride that wells up in us from time to time. But what Jesus is trying to communicate to these disciples is that they were not essential to the ministry. And that sounds a little harsh, so let me clarify that. Because we can get in a point where we convince ourselves that we are so great, we are so perfect, we are so fill in the blank, that God needs us to accomplish his plan. We make ourselves essential to the mission of God. Even in saying that, it sounds kind of crazy. But there are countless examples of times where we convince ourselves that God needs us or that, that we have made the plan work. And it's not us. It's not what we accomplish in this life. It's not our gifts that make the mission happen. God uses us as broken vessels to accomplish his mission. And as soon as we convince ourselves that we are not broken vessels being used by a merciful God, that pride begins to well up in us. I start out every sermon, whether it's on stage or when I'm sitting in the chairs, praying that God would speak through me. Because it's a reminder to me that no matter how impactful a sermon is, no matter how, how bad a sermon is that I give, is that it's not my doing, it's not my um, power, it's not my wisdom that is impacting people. It's God using me to impact people. Lowering ourselves before God means recognizing that we are not indispensable to his plan. And in doing that, it means that we have to accept his will in our lives. Because when we give up our own plan, we're giving up the stranglehold that we have on the wheel of our lives. Martin Luther describes humility as a joyful acceptance of God's will. It's saying, God, I'm taking my hand off the wheel. I trust you. I trust in your plan. I trust in the Holy Spirit's guidance. And I trust my life to Jesus. Belief, humility requires a trust in God. We are called to that trust. We are called to have a humble heart that is willing to follow Jesus. A humble heart that accepts Jesus like a child following his parent. You see, when we think about this idea of taking our hand off the wheel, of trusting and following in Jesus' guidance, Wayne gave me the illustration where it's like a child holding their parent's hand. When a child is holding their parent's hand, it doesn't matter where they're headed. It doesn't matter um, what they may face, how long the journey is, because they trust their parent. They don't need to know all the answers. They don't need to know every step along the way, but they trust their parent. They know that as long as I have a hold of their hand, I'm going to be safe and I'm going to be headed in the right direction as long as I have a hold of their hand. But when it comes to God, how often do we want to know, hey, God, what are the next steps? Tell me the plan. Let me know what's going on so that I can have some sense of control. We're not called to know everything. We're not called to have every step along the way, but we're called to hold onto the hand of Jesus and say, I will follow you wherever you go. I am a broken vessel that you are using to impact the kingdom. Please just let me be a part of what you're doing. Let me be a part of giving your value to other people. Let me help people see the value that you have given them when they are not seeing that from society. We are called to impact the least of these, to elevate them before ourselves, and to recognize that it is God doing the work. So we go forward in our service, in our days, in our weeks to come. How can you let go of the control, let go of the wheel, 
to humble yourself before God and say that I'm willing to go wherever you lead me and all I'm going to do is hold on tightly to your hand because I trust the plan that you have for my life. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the time that we have as a a body to come together. Um, It looks differently right now, uh, but I thank you that we still have this opportunity for community. Um, And I pray that you would be moving in us. I pray that you would be shaping us and guiding us um, to become more like your son, to to reflect more and more the nature of Jesus and I pray that we would not be alone in that endeavor, but that we would find community to support us, um, to hold us accountable, to encourage us, um, to care for us, so that we can become the best versions of ourselves, the healthiest versions of ourselves, so that this community can become the best, healthiest version of itself. God, we know that it is not our doing, our successes, our failures but we know that you are working through us, that you are growing us and shaping us. And I pray that we would begin to let go of the wheel and hold on tightly to your hand. We love you, Lord. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week, Northeast. I hope uh, God continues to teach you and uh, move in you on the, on the issue of humility and how you might pursue Jesus further. I look forward to seeing you for worship night on the lawn on the 22nd. Make sure you check out those guidelines so you are prepared so we can uh, both be safe and give praise to the Lord and ascribe the glory to his name. Have a great week.